All right, here we go on our first PowerPoint. Um, so these are the units that I definitely have planned for your semester. Okay, so we're starting unit one. Then we're gonna go into death investigation, then forensic serology and DNA. That's basically blood and body fluids and then DNA. Um, then blood stain pattern analysis, um, which is also called blood spatter. Then we're going to do a combined unit of anthropology, entomology, and odontology, and I'll define these terms um, during this lecture. And then uh, we are going to finish up the semester with serial homicide and pattern crimes. Um, hold on, Josh is meowing like crazy. I'm going to let him out. Sorry, like I told you, this is what's going to happen. Come on. Oh my God, minor drives me crazy. Okay. Um, I also hope to fit in, if we have time, um, some drug chemistry and toxicology um, and maybe some veterinary forensics, um, but we'll see how um, our time goes. Okay, so let's start out. Okay, so when we look at these two symbols, I you know can almost guarantee that you've probably seen them before. Okay, so on the left here, we have what is called the caduceus. And this is basically the sign for medicine, whether you um, are an EMT or a paramedic or a physician or um, in veterinary medicine. Okay, it's, it represents any type of medicine. And then over on the right hand side here, we have the scales of justice, which represents law. Okay, so anything legal. So when we look at what forensic science means, Oops, there's an intro. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Oh, sorry, you guys. Um, this is the symbol for forensic science. And it was designed that way because it's basically combining law, right here, and medicine, okay? And also bringing science in. Now, when I look at this, this actually looks like kind of like a D battery or like a double A battery to me. It's supposed to represent like the DNA helix, you know, meaning science. Okay. So when we define forensic science, here is the big wordy definition. Okay. So this is more detailed. It's when we apply science to laws okay, both criminal and civil, and we're gonna define what those are. Oh my God, my dogs are fighting over a bone, I'm sorry. That are enforced by police agencies and the criminal justice system. And the purpose of that criminal justice system is to make sure that no one innocent of a crime ever gets convicted. Now, is that reality? No, that is not reality, okay? Hold on, I'm gonna take that bone away, just a second. I don't know how you people who have human children handle it. You know, I can barely handle corgis. Anyway, okay, so is the criminal justice system perfect? <laughs> Absolutely not. We hear about false convictions. Um, we hear about people who are guilty getting acquitted. So no, but in a perfect world, yeah, um, we wanna only convict the guilty and protect the innocent, okay? But the easy and more succinct definition for forensic science is this. Anytime we take scientific principles and apply them to matters of law, whether it is a criminal case or a civil case, that is forensic science. Okay, and you can have forensic disciplines that only do work in civil cases. And in fact, that's where the big bucks are if you wanna go into forensic science, okay? Um, but yeah, it's both types um, of law. So let's define those two, okay? So civil law pertains to relationships, relationships between individuals, okay? So, and an individual can be a company or a corporation, okay? Or it could be, you know, an entire town government. Um, so say, for example, I finished teaching class, I want to run to hy V to pick up some groceries. hy V, someone there has just mopped the floor, but they don't put up a sign that says, hey, caution, wet floor. And from no fault of my own, I walk in, I slip and fall, and I suffer a head injury. 
right? So I guarantee you, I wouldn't sue Hy-Vee because I don't sue people, you know, but my insurance company definitely would sue Hy-Vee because they would say, okay, it's really your fault. So you can pay for her, you know, CT scan and her uh, medical treatment. Okay, that happens all the time. Okay, so in that example, um, it could be basically my insurance company versus the Hy-V Corporation. Or if I decided, hey, you know what? I actually um, had to take time off work and these medical bills are crazy, I could sue them. And so it would be Amy Clancy versus the Hy-V Corporation. So both of those would be an example of a civil case. Okay? So the thing about civil law is it's when you hear about lawsuits for, you know, tons of money and people are suing for, you know, emotional damage or um, expenses, you know, or my property was damaged. That is a civil case. So the difference is that in civil law, it can result in a person losing their money, their property, but they are not going to lose their freedom. Okay. So they are not going to go to jail. They're not going to go to prison. If it's a death penalty state, they're not going to be executed. Okay. Now, let me tell you, it, it, it still sucks really, really bad to be su uh, sued civilly. You can lose everything, basically. So it sucks, but you're not going to be put in jail. Okay, so because of that, because people don't soft, suffer a loss of freedom, the burden of proof to find someone guilty in a civil court is less than that of a criminal court. Okay, so the burden of proof in a civil court is a preponderance of the evidence. Okay, and I went ahead and searched that. Let's look at just a legal, you know, a, a general internet legal dictionary. And that definition was the greater weight of the evidence required in a civil lawsuit for the trier of fact okay, to decide in one favor of one side or the other. Okay, so you'll notice there's a lot of terms there that are kind of subjective, meaning not black and white, you know, kind of gray terms. You know, what is a preponderance? What is a greater weight? You know, one person could see that that burden has been met and another person on that same jury could be like no I don't think that's the greater weight okay but the key is the burden of proof is less in a civil case than in a criminal case because the person is not going to go to jail they're not going to lose their freedom okay so here's an example of a case that um, was in the news a lot and it's it actually still is and it was, it started out as just a civil case and now there are actually have been criminal indictments, okay? So this happened a few years back and what happened is people that were living in Flint, Michigan, which is a socioeconomically disadvantaged, okay? People there that live there don't have a lot of money. Um, and the water supply, so the water that they were using that was coming out of their faucets from the city looked like the water in these bottles, okay? It was not clear, It you couldn't drink it, you couldn't brush your teeth, you couldn't cook with it, you couldn't bathe with it. Um, it was terrible. And so people kept, kept complaining and basically the, the government of Flint, Michigan was like, what, it's fine, you can use it, no big deal, okay? And it actually would keep sending people bills and the citizens were like, I'm not paying my water bill for this crappy water, you need to fix it. And so they were racking up these huge bills. They would have their utility shut off. I mean, it was terrible, okay? And it wasn't until the children in this community started showing signs of lead poisoning, which were detected by local pediatricians, and the pediatricians reported that to public health, and then that caught the attention of the media that that's when the problem became a national news story, okay? so. After this all happened, and I, I still don't think the water supply is back to normal, okay? So this was a long time ago. Um, but basically, the people in that town are suing the state of Michigan because if you look at what their lawsuits are over, okay? So 
they don't want their water shut off. They just want the problem to be fixed. And number two is the big key to hold the state of Michigan financially accountable for what has been described as a man-made catastrophe. Okay, And what that language is saying is that hey, you gave my kid lead poisoning. If that kid develops cancer 10 years from now, you're gonna pay for all of that treatment, okay? And you are gonna be held responsible for that. That's what number two means, okay? So it's a big deal. And what had basically happened is the city manager, um, the water supply was good, and then to save money, the city manager switched the water supply to a different set of pipes, which were really old, and they were lead-based based pipes. And that's when this happened. Now, recent developments, um, from what I have read, that city manager has now been criminally indicted because it wasn't just, oh, I was just trying to save the city money. It was, ooh, I was getting a kickback if I could switch the water supply, okay? And that means there is intent and that is what makes it a criminal charge, okay? So the civil lawsuit is still out there, um, but now there are uh, criminal indictments to go along with it. Okay, so criminal law is, you know, there, there's no TV series that people love to watch that is like, ooh, let me watch civil law. Ooh, exciting, okay? All of the shows that people love, like CSI and Criminal Minds and NCIS and all of that stuff, are based on criminal law. And my personal favorite, of course, Law and Order, the old one, the old school one. So criminal law um, also in the media is probably where you've heard the majority of forensic science, okay? When actually an equal amount goes on in civil cases. You just don't hear about it because it's not considered as sexy by the media, okay? It's more juicy to talk about crimes that people have committed. So. Civil law, remember, was relationships between individuals, which could be corporations or governments or actually two individual people, okay? Criminal law is relationships between individuals and the state, okay? And in criminal law, the burden of proof for a jury to find a defendant guilty is much higher because now, not only can the defendant get a fine, can they lose their money and property, but also they could be going to jail or they could be going to prison. Or if it's, you know, a death penalty conviction because it's a capital offense, they could lose their life if they happen to live in a death penalty state. So the burden of proof in a criminal case is called beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you still have subjective terms there, right? What is reasonable, okay? I think it's reasonable to order a large pizza and eat the whole thing myself, okay? Other people may not think that's reasonable. So reasonable is a very subjective term, okay? And of course, I had to Google it in a, a law dictionary. So it still is kind of, you know, ugh, kind of gray terms. It's sufficient doubt on the part of jurors for the acquittal, meaning finding them not guilty, of a defendant based on lack of evidence. Okay, but what is sufficient to one jury member, because we're humans and humans are complex and different, may not be sufficient for another defendant. Okay, so it, there's still some wiggle room, but basically the way I've had it explained to me by prosecutors and you know friends of mine that have served on juries is, you gotta feel it in your gut, okay? That the prosecution has proven their case and that, you know, there is no reason, there is no doubt in your mind that this person did not commit this crime, okay? That's the best way I can explain reasonable doubt. In civil law, juries have some wiggle room. Because it's just a preponderance of the evidence, juries come, can come back and say, well, Okay, defendant, we think you're guilty, but we don't think you're totally guilty. So we're going to assess, you know, maybe 75% of the blame to you. And then 25% was maybe the plaintiff's fault. You know, so that's why you get a lot of wiggle room in terms of how much money someone gets when it's a civil case. In a criminal case, they are either convicted or acquitted. They either found guilty or not guilty. Okay, so... So I've been going for about 15 minutes. I'm gonna stop there 
This is gonna be part one because I like to break up these lectures into short chunks. Um, and then we're gonna head on and we'll pick up with what an affidavit is, okay? Thanks guys.